All right. Hello, Benjamin. Thanks so much for joining me. How are you doing today? Good. How are you doing, Chris? I am fantastic. Excited to be chatting with you. So uh, for, for those of my audience, because I usually just have authors on here. This is one of my mm. phenomenal bonus episodes with interesting people. So for those who have yet to meet you, is that a book you've written? Yeah, I have like seven books uh, in what a pile the? over there. Nobody, nobody tells me anything. So well, no, you... I keep them hidden. Really? Are they available? Well, um, I, I have a sub stack that's eking them out one chapter at a time. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. So, okay, well, I guess, I guess, give me, give me the backstory. Who are you? What do you do? <laughs> what do you, what do you write about? What do you talk about on your, on your YouTube channel slash podcast? Yeah, well, uh, there's two parts of my life. The first part, well, I mean, adult life. So 20s onward from probably around 18, 19 or 20, I uh, pursued the life of a cafe barista, poet, uh, author of novels and a preschool teacher. And then at about 36, I uh, needed to take a break from the workforce and go into the white tower of academe. Uh, mm -hmm. seeking as I was accreditation. I wanted to be, you know, an intellectual. So, you know, mm -hmm. not just somebody who's intellectual and then, uh, you know, a worker. So I found a college uh, in Olympia, Washington called the Evergreen State College, which is a very particular place. It has uh, a very particular, or at least it had a very particular model of education that was focused on independent learning, a lot of very self-directed study and mm -hmm. the structure of the school uh, was very immersive and for people who really want to get deep into one thing or another. And I had already put in about two and a half million words, you know, down on paper, just like typing and typing and typing and yeah. retyping and retyping and retyping. So I, I thought that that would be spacious enough for me to focus and really dig deep. And so I you know, took a break from work and I just spent all my time in the library and at different classes uh, trying to pursue a particular brand of fiction that kept on breaking for me mm -hmm. um, because I don't think it was supposed, I don't think you're supposed to write this way, but this is how I had to do it. Yeah. And then while I was at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, I was being immersed, not inoculated, inoculated, but immersed in a uh, particular strain of f progressive ideology that went critical uh, at the very end of my time at Evergreen and then proceeded to go critical across all of academia and all of media and many different, especially education and certain parts of the media. And mm -hmm. we can also see this same virus or uh, I guess not virus in a necessarily it depends that, that that's a loaded term morally or <laughs> valuation wise, but it is very infectious and it does create a very particular, um, mo for whatever institution it mm. takes over so uh because of what how things went viral at evergreen and by viral i mean the students protested for a week yeah. and they filmed it all on their cell phones and streamed that all to the internet and the ways in which they acted were totally beyond the pale and a uh, particular professor, Brett Weinstein, uh, tried to reason with them. That was on film. And then he was being kind of suppressed or not just the students, but th his colleagues and then the administration mm -hmm. were not giving his side or this other side of um, the argument or the discourse any sort of platform or taking it seriously. So he went and he began to speak out about it on Tucker Carlson, Joe Rogan, Dave Rubin, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that created a shock wave. Uh, well, the, the student, what the students did and how they, f how they acted and, and what they did by filming it created this very viral cringe compilation yeah. and uh, on YouTube. And, but it was so salacious that it spilled over and it ca caught a lot of attention and it brought to light uh, certain patterns of discourse or anti-discourse that were boiling up in other places, but particularly um, 
contained and uh, you know kind of like a sauce. It was boiled down into yeah. the essence at Evergreen because of the way that Evergreen operates as this kind of magnifier of things. And so what I saw were a lot of people commenting on the footage and Brett Weinstein was speaking out. But what I had been doing while I was at Evergreen, while I wasn't working on my work, was working in the media department and filming, mm. being on camera at all these different seminars and workshops and lectures and seeing that the, there's just this one strain of progressivism that we can probably call woke or whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of different names for this thing. Critical theory depends on how yeah. uh, popular or how you know, theoretical you want to get with the naming conventions. Um, but it was always being presented as the truth and any sort of questioning or pushback was suppressed or, you know, called mm -hmm. out or, you know, slandered. And Brett Weinstein particularly was witch hunted more or less for just criticizing this. And Brett Weinstein was very pro progressive, very progressive individual, very yeah. you know, liberal or left individual. So the people were talking about the way that the students were acting, but nobody had seen how they were being taught. And uh. I had watched this with my own eyes and knew where the files were and did some FOIAs or uh, FOIA is a federal thing, uh, public records yeah. requests, got all that footage and then started to archive the entire thing, the entire thing from probably 2014 up to 2017, which is when the explosion happened, all those workshop seminars. And then I compiled yeah. all that. Also, I did a lot of, my YouTube channel was just covering Evergreen for a while, going through all the emails, going through all these different facets of the story and trying Dang. to bring up as much nuance into this, which is kind of what I was studying to do in yeah. literature to create this panoply of different pieces of data or different kinds of narrative and then kind of make a symphony out of all these different kinds of uh, stories or different kinds of information basically yeah. and so i i spent a few years just covering that and then i compiled all the footage into a documentary um like 24 episodes and a couple of epilogues uh to yeah. just lay the whole thing out yeah so so this is a conversation that, you know, keeps coming up. Like, uh, you know, we talked about, like, I, I had John McWhorter on. I talked with a lot of people from, like, FIRE. I had Bonnie Kerrigan Snyder on here talking about indoctrination in K-12 schools. We'll get mm -hmm. to the critical race theory stuff in a little bit. But from what you're talking about with what happened at Evergreen, you saw the students acting in a particular way, right, shutting down discourse. But mm -hmm. you, you saw this happening because of what the faculty was kind of presenting. Like... If you could, can you can you can you kind of give me your theory for that? Because I I've been kind of hearing the narrative that you know it's these you know younger millennials slash Gen Z who's getting into this very woke ideology. Everything's racist, transphobic, misogynistic, sexist. You know what I mean? But yeah. it has to come from somewhere, right? So do you see yeah. the generation before that getting these ideas and now teaching it to the college age millennials or tell me how you kind of see that from a broader sense well there's millennial and then there's kind of gen z too and it, it kind of matters it kind of doesn't the mm -hmm. evergreen protesters were probably 19 to 22 so more gen z more having no memory of pre 9 11 no memory of pre-internet millennials mm. have at least a little bit yeah. of memory pre 9 11 pre internet and those two things or at least america's response to 9 11 um, shaped a certain sort of fear-based culture or security-based culture um, and then the internet is its own thing so when you say where's this coming from it's got to be coming from somewhere prior to these youngins mm -hmm. but it's also being um, shifted and sifted through the internet and you can see how the impact the internet is impacting the consciousness the group consciousness and the ideologies or the culture of these newer groups who are especially the teenagers who are going through processes of assembling their identity and, and mm -hmm. testing things and being kind of uh what was it dysregulated emotionally <laughs> because they're teenagers you know yeah. um that plus the internet is pretty intense that plus kind of late individualism or late um liberalism that kind of has a individualist bent has caused i think on a s cultural level a lot of uh 
older generation, Gen X, of which I am a part, and then millennials to kind of, and, and boomers to a certain extent, but to kind of, you know, be individuals and kind of move around and not have a extensive family structure and a, a, a mm -hmm. very deep time uh, regulated or time accrued relationship with a local community. And so these, these Gen Xers, you know, they mate and then they have these kids that are even further removed from a richer cultural time-based or like a long form kind of relational local yeah. um, situation. And so I think part of it is that these young folks are looking for people, looking for mentors, looking mm. for community that's not necessarily being satisfied by these kind of atomized families. And that is being given to them through Reddit, through Tumblr, and lesser extent to Twitter, but Twitter, you can see it kind of spill over into Twitter, also 4chan and all these internet yeah. things. So the internet is one major thing. But with regards to the way that the uh, the adults in the room so-called respond to the students specifically in Evergreen, specifically if you just take Evergreen and you just kind of... I, one of my theories is that Evergreen is the petri dish to show this ideology working out. But the internet is a big part of that because of the way that the actual protest was seeded on Facebook and how the policing of communication and the sorting of people into villain and victim uh, happened through the internet, but it also happened in person. But there's that cohort. And then there is this place called Evergreen, very progressive. They come on campus, their orientation and I have all the footage of these orientations, which got progressively more progressive as yeah. time went on until they kind of went to the end of being progressive and they had to start rolling back because this whole kind of MO of we are going to liberate the oppressed and we're going to solve racism. The first thing that the new president said in 2015 and then everything that happens after 2015 is that racism uh, great strides were made during the civil rights movement, but racism is still alive and well, and it is our job to basically to, to end racism. That is what we are here to do, which sounds like a big project. Yeah. <laughs> and right, so it's a big project, but also is the school or is academia particularly suited to doing that work, which is activist work, which is, you know, changing the world. And Ooh. you go back to this kind of Marx, Marx, uh, it's not cliche. He has the saying that Marx saying that philosophers so far had sought to understand the world. Our job is to change the world. So Evergreen became explicitly an activist college. And you see that happening with the American Psychological Association. You see that happening with many municipal governments. You see that happening across, you know, Coca-Cola. A lot of these corporations are saying, our job is no longer to teach, it's to create a good society. So what happened at Evergreen was that the organization shifted toward being change agents specifically with race. And then they introduced a bunch of critical race theory, or they began to practice critical race theory. And mm -hmm. I have footage of these increasingly sanctimonious, more and more church-like events mm -hmm. where it would be garbed in data and PowerPoints, and they'd show this yeah. data. And even they're showing you this data that Evergreen's doing better than most every other place. In, yeah. in America, at least with regards to uh, serving the Latino and Latina community and serving uh, students of color of all varieties, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but but while the, while those charts are up there, they're saying that we this the time is now. We have to be better. We have to change. And then you have all these professors saying that Evergreen is as racist as any institution in the West historically. Yeah. And when we teach uh, when we teach people to prize meritocracy, we're actually causing oppression. And when we, when we teach that all lives matter, we, we're saying that black lives don't matter. And 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 the way that they're speaking becomes more and more sanctimonious. And mm. that happens with the race thing. There's one quote where this person says that our job is when, when a black person speaks, we listen and we believe, mm -hmm. right? well, which 
black person, like they all think the same, you know, there, there's none of that. Like we just assume that the black people are hurting. And so what happens, there's a selection process on which black person is being listened to. And it's the one who inhabits this liberatory, oppressed person gaining victory over the, those who have victimized them, which mm -hmm. would be the entire institution. So ironically, you have this institution that's bending over backwards and dismantling its original mandate to be an institution of education specifically to solve the problem of race, being accused by the students of being the most racist place yeah. in America or the world ever. That also happened with regards to the gender vector, where the pronoun thing started happening and everybody had to be, and it's not just you have to declare your pronouns. There's no discussion about that. What does it mean that you declare your pronouns? What, what are we actually doing when we start doing that? What are we doing to the language? What are we doing to our brains? And then what are we doing forcefully top down with our society and then our interpersonal relationships? No question about it. This is just the thing to do. And then while we're doing it, no joking, this is really serious. Like this is life or death. People will kill themselves if you don't call them this, this word that they, mm -hmm. that they've ascribed to themselves. And it's just, yeah. and it got tighter and more and more intense. And yeah. then the students started to figure out how to game that. And when they gamed it, they would interrupt these meetings. And he, I have footage of like protest after protest after protest. And the administration would just let them do it. So yeah. oh, they're, they're acting this out. So there's no pushback at all. Yeah. 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 That's that conversation about where the, you know, where are the adults in the room? You know what I yeah. mean? And I think that's kind of the issue that, you know, where people aren't talking about enough is that there's not enough pushback. We're taking things at face value and you're just kind of letting, especially this younger generation just come up and just kind of steamroll. Right. And I'm a, I'm a father. And like, I, I have to push back on my own son and mm -hmm. be like, Hey, this is, you know, maybe we should talk about this or you're seeing this in the incorrect way. But, you know, mm -hmm. I want to, I want to touch on that kind of catastrophizing, right? Like we've mm -hmm. seen it with, uh, you know, the Dave Chappelle recent protests and everything like that. And everything mm -hmm. kind of, turns into this just just extreme emergency right people are dying or like you mentioned like if we don't say Genocide. this correctly people are going to kill themselves and listen like i'm a recovering drug addict most of my life has been you know uh well in recovery at least since getting sober in 2012 has been like mental health you know advocacy and you know i, I talk a lot about suicide and overdoses and stuff things that are killing people but i know if i push that to the extreme and i inflate the numbers or inflate the problem I'm crying wolf. You know what I mean? I have to look at the mm. real data, see what's happening. And that's kind of what I saw with the Dave Chappelle debate. I was like, wait, so mm. are we to believe that there's like a genocide happening that, you know, I don't know about. But anyways, anyways, here's a question that I have for you uh, mm. in regards to like the critical theory, or I even asked guests about this when we're talking about what's happening in schools and college campuses. Do you see this happening on both sides of the equation, like the catastrophizing, right? Like yesterday, for example, I, I was listening to someone commenting about the critical race theory, who's on the side of, we need to get this out of schools, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I'm like, are you kind of catastrophizing this? They're like, think about the children. Our mm -hmm. children are gonna think that they are these white devils. <laughs> I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. is it really mm -hmm. that bad? So I'm curious mm -hmm. if everybody from all parts of these debates are catastrophizing to an extent. What do you think? Uh, well, the catastrophizing is a certain, it's a it's game theory. It's it's a certain pattern of behavior in order to produce a result, mm. and we are in the age of being overstimulated. Again, you go to the internet, and how we get our news is that there's so much information presented to us that our brain actually sorts it according to threat level, mm. right? And that's an evolutionary principle. If you've ever gone out to your lawn and jumped because you thought you saw a snake and it's just a hose and you feel yeah. embarrassed. Like it's better to be embarrassed and a fool than mm -hmm. to actually get bit. And with regards to the internet collapsing space and time and then overloading us with information, we pay attention to threat. When we pay our attention to a threat, it magnifies the threat because more people are paying attention to the threat. And then our apparatuses of uh, sifting or the gatekeepers or whatever, the apparatus of sifting that is outside of us is responding to what we pay attention to because of the model of the internet is to keep the eyes engaged, keep in, 
people engaged and to mm -hmm. foster engagement. The most engagement is going to be the lowest part of your brain, which would be the fight, flight, or F-U-C-K. And yeah. what is the internet filled with? It's filled with pornography of all these different sorts. It's filled with pornography with regards to threat levels on all these things. And then with, you know, straight mm -hmm. up uh, classic. Um, well, that, anyways, that's a whole other conversation. But when people catastrophize, they get attention. And so they bring attention to a thing. So does it, over time, does that actually serve the... Uh, well, the thing is, the catastrophizing, it deflates after it's seen that the threat isn't as big as it's made out to be. Mm -hmm. But at least it gets attention there, it keeps attention there, and then you can start to herd people into some sort of activity, showing up to school board meetings. If you are showing that a Virginia school, or where, I think it was a Virginia school, was in, in the library, it has some depictions of uh, homosexual activity, like with fellatio, in a comic book in the school libraries yeah. um you know, that's like you see this stuff is being available to kids the question is well they can get it anywhere but do we want it in schools no we don't want it in schools you can see you can cherry pick or nut pick or whatever you can see that this stuff that is implementing critical race theory it's not critical race theory itself but it's acting out critical race theory by describing basically the entire system of the U.S. as a sorting mechanism between the oppressor and the oppressed or the victim and the yeah. victor. And it's gone through by dividing people by race and then assigning these characteristics to those characteristics. If you are dark of skin, then you must be you know, constantly aggressed upon micro and macroly, you know, okay which is really religious when you get into implicit bias, which is that which is your soul, and then systemic racism, that which is God, you have this stuff that's bigger than the human or lower than the human, stuff that you can't really control. And if you start to build a framework like that, it gets religious, mm -hmm. but you talked to McWhorter, so I'm sure you guys dove into that. Just yeah. with regards to catastrophizing, that's a method of getting attention and then siphoning, or, you know, uh, you know, not siphoning, but channeling that attention into action. Yeah. So it's a useful tool, but like you were saying, with regards to drug advocacy and a lot of this advocacy, it actually doesn't help the people that it's supposed to help, especially a lot of the racial stuff could be broken mm -hmm. down into class. And you see, yeah. I just interviewed a Native American woman and she was saying, Native Americans, they're less than 1% of the population, but we're constantly trotted out to get things done. We're a symbol. And so we are like, people are changing our language and, and changing the names of football teams while our communities are dying from yeah. alcoholism and drug. And then you go and she went into the all cops are bastards or the BLM riots. The indigenous were, you know, BIPOC, the indigenous were brought into that when they could actually use a good policing. They actually need that. There are women and uh, there's a lot of domestic violence. There's a lot of drug mm -hmm. use. They could use reform in that, but defunding the police would absolutely hurt them. So, yeah. you know, so when, when we get to that level of politicking, a lot of that catastrophizing has a lot of unintended consequences other than the fact that it rewards those who do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. I've had, I've had some guests on recently, like Bacha Ungo Sargon about her book, uh, talking about woke media. Then I had uh, Vivek yeah. Ramaswamy on talking about his book, Woke Inc. And, and yeah, like I see the woke conversations, the culture war issues taking away from the real problems, like these class issues, these people who need, you know, uh, they need social services. workers, they need therapists. Yeah. yeah. They need services and stuff like that. But if we're just like, so with the CRT thing, I wanted to ask you because since mm -hmm. since you touched on evolutionary psychology and that's that's my shit, I love talking about it, right? So mm -hmm. when it comes to CRT, here's what I'm trying to understand. Like my son's 12. So the other day, the other like a couple of weeks ago, I went to my son. I was hearing these conversations about CRT in schools. I looked at my son. So I'm half black. My son's a quarter black. So I look white. He looks whiter than I do, right? And I looked at him. I'm like, hey, have you ever in school, have they ever taught you that just you're bad for being white? And he looked at me like I was just insane. He's like, what are okay. you talking about, right? So yeah. this is, uh, so I commonly ask people like, how big of a problem is it? How many schools yeah. are doing it, you know? But I do understand like, hey, we need to stop it before it grows. Like you talk about with Evergreen, that kid 
spider out. But anyways, going yeah. into evolutionary psychology, I've I've had psychologists on talking about group identity. You see it with polar, polarization, right? I identify as a conservative. Here are our values. Here are what we stand for. I identify as a liberal. I identify as a progressive. We sort ourselves into these groups. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right, evolutionarily, we see people who look different and our brain just automatically does stuff, right? It says, oh, you look different than me. Why is that, right? Now, mm -hmm. to the extent... I don't know. That's the debatable part. But I guess my question yeah. is, uh, your your buddy, uh, James Lindsay, shared a sheet, you know, this being handed out, you know, to kids or whatever. And I looked at the, I looked at the paper. I don't know if you saw his tweet, but it said like, you know, talking about identities and which group and everything. I looked at it really carefully. I said, is there anything harmful? Is there anything in here that I was like, this can make a kid feel bad about who they are? I mm -hmm. didn't necessarily see it. So the mm -hmm. question is, do you think mm -hmm. that this shouldn't be taught at all? Because my concern is we're afraid to even have these conversations, almost like saying, don't talk about sexual education. Don't talk about boys and girls. Yeah. Don't talk about, yeah. don't talk about how babies are made. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Should we completely yeah. eliminate it, uh, eliminate it? Or you, you, yeah. you work with preschoolers. Like, is there a way yeah. to talk with kids about this in a realistic, non you're worse than another race type way? Yeah. Um, there has to be, uh, it's the human experience that, I mean, if we just go back to the bedrock of Western culture, it would be Judeo Christian culture and then Greek culture kind of combining. And there's a lot of othering there. They're othering the Canaanites, you know, they're yeah. making these Philistines out to be huge monsters. We have to kill them, you know, like, you know, and yeah. you see permutations of that going on to this day. So how do we manage if if we aren't able to discuss tribalism discuss the history of uh, how tribalism has created race and perpetuated race or our notions of race then how do we actually untangle it and mm -hmm. what is the line between having those conversations and then saying well we need to solve this such as ibram kendi has written that we have to solve past discrimination with present discrimination and future <laughs> Yeah. future discrimination with present discrimination, which is just this Manichaean, just endless cycle of uh, serpent eating its own tail. So can we talk about these things without and, and transcend them? Can we have a transcendent relationship to the blood that courses through history, you know, and all that violence and all the all the outcomes of, let's just say, with African descendant of slaves, to what degree has... Uh, being a slave affected a family over generations and then Jim Crow, how are all these things affected? And in the wake of the evergreen protests, I started doing these videos and somebody who I had not yet really pissed off um, yeah. that I respected, uh, he came up to me and he said, well, there's this redlining stuff and there's the way that the black people have treated, you know, and da -da -da -da. I'm like, well, okay. There's that, and then there's all this footage of people being told when they can pee, and people being told that white people need to do this and get black people water, and black people, you know, attacking, you know, like the, the, the optics of the activism has completely ruined, yeah. <laughs> just optically, it's gotten out of hand, and why has that gotten out of hand? So if we're going to have those conversations, we're going to have to actually have the conversation about the conversation, which I guess yeah. this is what the comp conversation is. With regards to sexuality, with regards to sex, that is now being infiltrated by this gender ideology that is not based on biology. It's based mm -hmm. on ideology, and that comes from critical theory, too. It comes from a permutation of critical theory called queer theory. And the way that that's promulgated is that gender is your soul and your body doesn't matter because we can just change your body to fit your soul, mm -hmm. right? And that's what you have now. And, and a lot of this stuff with regards to race and with regards to gender is happening really intensely in higher education and then really intensely in education higher institutions, right? Institutions of education. So it's mm -hmm. being taught to the teachers and then the teachers are going into the schools and to a greater or lesser extent, the teachers have to learn this stuff. And because of the ideological nature of it, 
it, it sorts people into, can you go through this gender stuff? If not, then you're a bigot, you need to go. Can you go through these different trainings? If not, you're a bigot, you need to go. So it sorts people, yeah. even if they're not teaching it, they were either putting up with it and pantomiming it, or they actually kind of believe it and go along with it. And so that'll start to seep in. Yeah. So it, I don't think that if we want to revitalize and reform our education system, we have to get to nuts and bolts and say, okay, reading, writing, and arithmetic or something like that, we need to go back. We are trying to teach you skills, not behavior yet. And once we, once, once we ensure that you are at grade, uh, reading level, mm -hmm. then we can start to introduce these really complex conversations about oppression and victimhood and how to yeah. solve that, right? But uh, yeah, I spoke with a teacher at a high school in uh, Chicago, and the building, their high school is falling apart. They have blackouts on electricity. Mm. They're spending tens of thousands of dollars on these diversity, equity, and inclusion um, seminars, not fixing uh, the building. And then also what that has the effect of is that all the problems, which are not just in the physical you know, building, but in the education and the kids are not getting taught, all of that can be waved away and say, whiteness, oppression. Yeah. It's, it's, all, it's the system, it's the system, it's the system. So nobody has to actually fix the system that isn't working because the system's already broken. We need to break it even further, you know? So yeah. we have to get back to brass tacks and ensure that kids are getting skills first and foremost, and then we can introduce really complex conversations. Because if they don't have the skills to read and write and think through these things, then what they're gonna be doing is dumbing those ideas down of history, of of oppression and of, of oppressor, and they won't be able to even do anything other than just go full aggression with it. They yeah. won't. And what happened at Evergreen is that the, the common uh, ability of discourse, of having higher reason, was all brought down to the lowest common denominator of you are the enemy if you don't get on board with changing the world and changing evergreen by having a stupid protest right yeah yeah no i i i i love what you said about just we need to have conversations about the conversation so yeah. so if i'm understanding what you're saying right like you know race these conversations about gender like i i don't see them going away anytime soon but if I'm understanding you correctly, like there is there is a conversation to be had, but it's a matter of when. Like, when, like is it after they learn the basics of, hey, I could do math, I could read, and stuff like that, and how to implement them in a mature way. Just for example, uh, mm -hmm. I, I've had um, people on here, like Dan Golden, he wrote a book, The Price of Admission, about the screwed up college admission systems and how money plays a big role. Like if I have a dad who can donate a $10 million building, yeah. I'm probably getting in, right? And I have a 12 year old son and that's something I have to think about. I have to, I have to tell him, right? Like, you know, it's my choice, but I've decided to tell him like, hey, this college admission system can be rigged against you, but that's not a reason to give up and not try, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, well, I don't think have you ever thought of using your YouTube clout to muscle your way him into Yale? You know? <laughs> I don't know. I, sitting at 81,000 subscribers, I don't know if that's enough. Like maybe what? maybe if I get to, you know, like some James <laughs> some uh, James Charles numbers or Logan Paul or something, <laughs> you know, but but like uh, when it comes to race, like is that their conversation to be had? Like, hey, one day you might meet some racist ass person and here's how you to deal with it. Like, because it seems like mm -hmm. parents are afraid to talk to their kids about race, right? They don't want teachers talking about it. So if parents aren't talking about it, if teachers aren't talking about it, yeah. who the hell is going to talk to kids about just some realities and the harshness of life? Do we need to get them each a mentor and say, hey, here's what can happen? And, you know, like, I, yeah, I don't know yeah. what you think the solution is because they are real things, you know? Well, within the critical race theory framework, not necessarily the theory itself, but the framework in which it is implemented, um, at least in Evergreen, and you can see this in the indoctrination or the orientation sessions, is that the individual discrete acts of racism are, they don't, they don't matter anymore. It doesn't matter if you don't act racist as a white person. Mm. You are complicit in racism for not fighting against the racist structures, right? So it's not about even dealing with difficult situations on an interpersonal level. All interpersonal activity is projected onto this historical sociological framework. And so everybody's ego is inflated to, mm. and they talk about this, I am a black body, 
you are a white body and then they just play pinball or pool and bash yeah. against each other and so there there's problems within the ideology that need to be very finely sussed out and that's not going to happen on these crt is bad gop good uh democrats uh good gop racist levels of the the federal the federal consciousness even the state consciousness is not capable of having the conversations to yeah. really say okay how do you deal with the effects of historical racism and the structures uh, that have sorted people into you know based on race or based on any of these markers probably the most important would be class and why that's not being yeah. talked about is because race insulates the elite from having to actually do that which you probably talked about several times yeah so it's really difficult to have those conversations and what we need to do is create content that has those conversations yeah and and model that because i think ultimately ultimately people yearn for nuance right they yeah. yearn for questions and jokes and laughter and all the stuff that's outside of outrage culture or, or agreement disagreement basic opinionation that's happening on the internet so with regards to schools the structure of the schools is failing on several different vectors ideologically we need to strip the ideology out and just say no ideology until we figure out what school is for yeah. and that's what it needs to be about um, and then we can rebuild, but at this point, it's all a mess. It's just a huge mess, and so yeah, we're not having that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. So, so let's let's jump because something I've been dying to ask you about because I see this often. I, and like, there's a there's a I don't know. It seems like there's a real personality, then there's like a Twitter persona, oh. right? Right. So I'm hoping, like for example, you you're good buddies with like James Lindsay, one of my favorite books, oh. and I had Peter I had Peter Bergosian on to talk about how to have difficult or impossible conversations. Mm -hmm. I read that book after I got canceled on YouTube, and I was losing my mind. I was like, Wait, so you were you canceled by the structure or by the commenters? Like, by the, or by the commentary other actually the other drama the drama channels if if you ever want to dive into that it's a oh, long you drawn out story. Okay. oh yeah okay. if, yeah i'm surprised you didn't just google the rewired tool my channel doesn't even pop up first you'll see all the videos with millions of views telling that i'm a terrible oh, person my God. Okay. yeah it's, have it's, you done a video on that yourself oh oh yeah yeah and then okay. i took a break to make sure i stayed sober and <laughs> oh wow okay <laughs> yeah okay. it was it was some crazy shit, right but uh but yeah so like i read i read the book from james and peter and I was like, cool. Like it got me into like epistemology and like saying, hey, why do you think what you think and stuff like that, whatever. But anyways, love that book. And then I'm like, I'll follow Peter and James on Twitter, right? Peter is about at about a four or five on Twitter. James out is at what? like out of 10, right? Okay. And then you have James, he's at like a 15, right? But James, <laughs> James in conversation and James on Twitter, two different people. You yeah. like uh, before this, and I'm getting caught up on your stuff. Like you are, you come across as a very like curious, interested person. Like you like when I watch you have conversations, I'm like, this dude is fucking curious, right? But on Twitter, that is a different person, right? So how okay. <laughs> how how does that how does that work? Like I'm I'm curious because I actually talked to yeah. somebody the other day and they were saying like yeah like Twitter's my avatar that's not really me and stuff I'm like I guess you know so yeah, I'm just yeah, like I'm like yeah, now it's my yeah. opportunity to ask somebody a little bit more about that yeah, yeah so yeah, how yeah. do you see that from I guess like a, a moral perspective right like do you okay. feel like you're ever fanning the flames Ethics. because you know okay yeah. like that's where I'm curious because you seem yeah, like effects. you're a good you seem like a great guy to me but I'm like seems like he trolls a little on Twitter so how does that work okay how does shit posting work into <laughs> the righteous cause of nuance there we um, go it's uh well there are ethical um matters to consider but first and foremost uh, there's two levels to it before you even get to the moral aspect or the ethical aspect there's the there's the game theory of it, and then there's the discourse mm. level of it, right? Okay. And so the game theory is about what is able to be communicated through 240 characters yeah. and yeah. how the game of Twitter actually operates by, by distilling information into these chunks. And so mm -hmm. there's two levels of game when I'm doing Twitter, and one is literary, game and the other one's a political game so the mm. liter the political game is to make a statement or to react 
to something that's going on. And what's going on usually is on, again, and I disparage this constantly, it's going on at the federal level or it's going on the state level it's, or it's going on an ideological level, an intrapersonal or superpersonal mm-hmm. level. And so to take those concepts up there and then to to kind of take them down and throw them back at, at it and to kind of like... It's like this huge snowball fight with a lot of different words, like the War of the Five Armies from The Hobbit, but it's everybody's just <laughs> throwing these snowballs, right? And you don't know which person's on which team or yeah. if, if they're playing one team in order to position another team later on down the road to get another kind of thing to happen. Yeah. And with regards to federal level politics, with, with, with regards to reacting to the reaction to... Mm. The Trump, which is what I'm doing, I'm reacting to reactions more than I'm reacting to the action, mostly because the action itself, let's say that an event happens. One six happens, right? Mm-hmm. One six is, uh, uh, one six happens after 2020 <laughs> happens, right? <laughs> so in 2020, what happens is that two billion dollars of insurance claims are filed with regards to these political actions that happen with regards to a certain sort of event that's politically charged and then that is reacted to very distinctly by let's say cnn msnbc Mm -hmm. that are playing defense for these people playing defense for blm because it suits their purposes it suits their purposes kind of ideologically because it kind of seems like this is the righteous cause but also suits their purposes of getting trump out by making trump uh, basically the cause of all these things. And mm. while I think that they're kind of complicit too. So there's this weird kind of game that's happening on a media level with regards to that. One six happens, January six happens, and that entire 2020 can be completely forgotten. Mm-hmm. And these five, six hours at this one spot, this very uh, symbolically potent spot can now go forth and be used. Yeah. So in in the wake of one six, all I'm thinking about is not one six because we don't know what happened at one six. Just as like we don't know what happened at Evergreen until somebody spends four years going through all the footage mm-hmm. and trying to put it down, like I did with Evergreen. So I already know I was trained at Evergreen that all the reactions to the event are going to be sifted through people's wavelength or bandwidth to be able to make sense of the event. And so the real one six happens after one six. The real mm. one six, the one six that everybody's talking about, isn't the one six that happened there with all these people doing this really chaotic action, who, what, when, where, why. Not everybody's doing the same thing. It's it's a complex event. But Washington Post says, okay, this is what this means. Dan Rather says, this is what this means. CNN says, this is what this means. And Fox is like, oh, well, we can't do this. We can't do much with this, right? Yeah. Because we don't know how to figure out what this means because it's basically our side and they're playing this ideological game. But the catastrophizing with regards to 1-6, that, the, that 1-6 represents a threat to our democracy is not even debatable it's not even debatable. It is a threat to our democracy. It's a super important, super potent event. And everything that happened in 2020 was for racial justice, right? Mm-hmm. It's all for racial justice. So what I react when I react to 1-6 is the reaction to this 1-6 that people have made up in their minds. They have this narrative that they're promoting. Dan Rather said something about, I'm not over 1-6. And everything that happened after 1-6, until we solve everything that happened, well, what are you talking about? Like some nut jobs like went in there and did a panty raid on the government i mean maybe it's an important symbolic thing and it's not good but is it the most serious thing that's ever happened and what about all those riots what about everything in 2020 there's so much cognitive dissonance so when i pick up and i throw i'm trying to twist that narrative and because of the way that i do it i can't be i can't be bipartisan with this stuff because I'm in a very progressive place in, you know, in my surroundings and I've seen the end of progressivism at Evergreen <laughs> and then I, I, I'm watching the West Coast go along that and implement that and everything. So I'm kind of pushing, I'm pushing in one way, I'm pushing in one direction, which makes me kind of biased in my content. Over, yeah. over time, you're saying I, I will just by the basic mechanism of agreement and disagreement which is how most people sort their content i will gain more a 
more attention from those who I agree with. And my responsibility, if I want to be flexible, is yeah. to then start to play with them and to upset them. And yeah. it helps to have more than one topic to position yourself in. So if, if you think that I'm all Republican, I'm like, I'm not. It's just I, I, I converge with basically what the Republicans are doing with this one kind of inflection point, And then I'm I'm on these other fronts, too. So with yeah. regards to Twitter, you have to look at the Twitter persona as something that happens over time and as a supplement, not as a what, what's the what's the word? The awesome word play. I can't remember it. Twitter's a supplement not a substitution for my entire body of work. My, mm. my interviews on YouTube and then my commentary on YouTube about Twitter and from the networking that I do on Twitter, that's how I get my interviewees is that I'm like, who's making interesting sense? Who's making yeah. interesting sense? And then, you know, and then I, I pull them out of the networking process of yeah. Twitter, um, which, you know, then sometimes I connect with people. And I'm like, listen, I'm shit posting right now because I thought of a cool wordplay, which is the literary side of what I'm doing. So yeah. what I really want to do is this nuanced stuff, but I have to play this game and know that I'm doing it tongue in, tongue in cheek because all this is is sentence. This is it's an MMO RPG made yeah. of sentences. That's what it is. Yeah. It's a literary endeavor. So there's that whole literary side of what I'm doing. Yeah. Let me let me tell you, Benjamin. That that like I hope a listeners made as much sense of that as I did because I've been thinking about that so much lately kind of what what you said because you know I you know I'm my my podcast I just started it in May uh it's it's gotten pretty big I've gotten some notable guests and everything like that you know yeah and I try <laughs> I try that to ignore me talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I try to have these like nuanced conversations for people all over the spectrum I have I have people talking about you know just uh violence against women but also people talking about you know the trans debates and the racial debates all these things but anyways what I've noticed mm -hmm. is the extreme, the trolling or whatever, that's what gets attention, right? Yeah. So like you said, like the, the subs, the, you know, that's the supplement to yeah. this thing. To the substance, and, yeah. And I've been debating on it. So maybe, maybe you can give me some uh, moral slash ethical device because that's where I get, that's where I get fucked up, Benjamin. I'm like, is it, is it ethical of me to kind of do these more extreme views, extreme opinions that I know will get more attention because I think I also have fear because that's what led to my downfall on YouTube. Oh, I knew what was going to shit posted. I knew what, well, I knew, well, I did clickbait. I was the, I have a background in marketing and shit like that too. Okay, so okay. I was like, I know, I know the type of uh, thumbnails and titles that are going to get attention, yeah. but a lot of people only look at that and they'll say who you are based on titles and thumbnails and not the content. Right. So I think mm -hmm. part of it's a fear, right? If I do mm -hmm. that again, if I do what I know what works, that could mm -hmm. fucking just backfire right but then there's also that ethical part right like because there's got to be part of you there's got to be a little part of you where you're like am i stirring the pot too much am i am i am i getting people rowdy with trying to use this supplemental uh or mm -hmm. mmo type game theory to meet mm -hmm. my own ends you know what i mean mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm how how do you balance that but you are I, like as somebody who i can see you're trying to you're living for a larger purpose you're being very utilitarian like i'll do this shit over here to hopefully drive people to my youtube channel where i'm having nuanced important conversations yeah is yeah. that correct well, so so how do you balance all that insofar as i use twitter it is a sentence uh publishing machine for me they call it microblogging. um <laughs> And I do aphorisms, I do puns, and then I do political stuff. What do you think gets the most attention? Political. Yeah. So, I mean, people only see that, but I'm doing all those other things, you know. I'm, and usually usually I don't publish something or I don't post something unless I'm doing some sort of clever wordplay. Like, yeah. I, have to be re I have to be just making people think about what I'm saying, right, by interrupting them. And that's why I haven't published any of my actual books, because every sentence is like you like i'm doing something awkward uh, at first but you're like oh he's he's making me think through how language operates or making me through think through how narrative operates or how poetry operates so there's all these things where i'm i'm doing a lot of meta in that so mm -hmm. on there's that there's that creative side you're just you're just playing around and you should be playing around with a lot of things and, and expressing yourself in a lot of different directions. People are going to pay attention to a certain sort of content and they're either going to put you in a box for that and then be confused when you 
violate what they thought of you or they'll like they'll completely ignore it because they need you for their own purposes they need mm. to say benjamin boyce is this thing and i've done a lot of work within the gender debate and have aligned with the causes of a certain ideological group and <laughs> they have a certain sort of way of thinking and and they have a certain sort of uh telos or what they want to do they want to uh, save women or do something about saving women from men or you know and uh, you know the feminist community is multifaceted and created of a lot of different moving parts and a lot of different independent mm -hmm. people it also has a lot of people who are there for trauma and who are expressing trauma and it has a lot of people who don't understand how humor operates just like the joke <laughs> just like many jokes say so while I produce content specifically within uh, the gender debate or with regards to what it is to be a woman and what how a man and women operate and everything about gender, not just the trans stuff, everything about gender, I do a lot of that stuff because it's fascinating to me. Um, I know that I'm creating content that's serving that community. I'm platforming voices. I'm introducing them to new people and I'm, I'm, I'm lending my platform to people who are unheard or who are lower down the totem pole and I'm giving them more views. So I'm actually helping them, but on my terms. So I'm not, I'm not an ally, which is a corrupted term. An ally used to mean we have a, you know, we're, we're working together. Mm -hmm. It now ally means you're basically my support. Yeah. Right. And, and that's not how I do it. So with regards to feminism and anti-feminism, I'm, I'm balking at the anti-feminists just as much as I'm playing around balking at the feminists and specifically the ideologically motivated people who want content that they agree with that supports them, that doesn't challenge them because they don't have time to be challenged. They're, they're fighting this great fight. So I do a lot of content that turns off or um, causes anti-feminists to get really riled up and like, why is this woman, why are you not challenging her? You know, she, she's a misandrist and da, 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 and they go in the comments and they rail. And then I do content that the, the feminists are like, Benjamin, you're a terrible ally. Da, 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 da. And, and what happens is that the internet sorts for these people who want to be expressive and the expression actually algorithmically props up my it boosts the content. So like the actual content was just the discuss discussion that has more content than just what they're reacting to, which would be a joke or a thumbnail. Even mm -hmm. I titled one thing, Irrational Feminism, which was a play on the content of that episode, which was with Erica Bakiloki, who is a Catholic author who goes through and she shows the entire progress of feminism from the rational enlightenment up to mm. the present day. And, and so it's talking about the rational origin and blah, 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 blah. People are like, feminism is irrational. Feminism, you know, like the anti-feminists who are just thinking in that fight mode. And then I did an uh, interview the other day. And this is, I hope this is relevant to what you're asking. Yeah. I'm just, I'm talking about my material because it, it's a methodological choices that I'm making in it. Mm -hmm. I did an interview another day with a woman who is really fighting really hard against gender ideology because it's manifesting these ideas that are completely illogical and then translating them through medicine into a physical reality mm -hmm. that has a bunch of negative consequences. And yeah. she's a brilliant woman. And she's kind of, I guess she's a lesbian. I don't know if that, it doesn't really matter, but she kind of, she's playing to the radical feminist group. The rad fems are like, this is the content that we want. It's created by a woman for women against these creepy men or whatever. And I did an interview with her and we we're joking the whole time. We're joking and joking and joking and talking about the matriarchy killing men, you know? So that's why women live longer because men have all the power in the world, but at least women live longer because they kill the men by feeding them bacon wrapped in butter you know, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, and the way that I cut that was that there's uh, was that I took the very end of our conversation and I put it at the beginning and I, I was referencing jokes that we were making that you don't understand that why I'm making those jokes until the very end of the episode. And I got a lot of flack for those jokes mm -hmm. from these people are like, why are you are you why are you making fun of turfs why are you making fun of uh, the matriarchy and they're like oh we established a rapport so, so it you get the hook but the hook isn't it the hook is to draw them in mm -hmm. but so you, you have there's three parts of this whole content creation game you have to capture attention 
maintain attention yeah. and then modif modify attention at the end, right? Another yeah. metaphor is that you have to be interesting, but you have to take that interest and get, build that interest like a bank, like the bank, and then you hand it back, they have something more. So yeah. it has to have, like Twitter is really good because of the way that attention operates on that level is like you make a zinger you make a spice or something like that or you do a bunch of posts about a spicy thing to variate on the theme and and then you and then you have other forms of content that you are balancing that out so i've made things i i don't like lying and i don't like being wrong so i only retract things i've retract three types of things one is when i'm misinformed Mm. Uh, one is when I'm, uh, when it appears that I don't know the whole story and so I'm making something up and so I guess a, a version of lying but unintentionally because I don't try to intentionally lie, um, which is different than manipulation I guess, but I don't try to lie, lie. And then one is when I say something that's a joke and then the context is terrible. Like, yeah. like I make a joke about something and then some big event happens. So everybody's reading my tweet in reference to this thing that I wasn't thinking about at all because it uh, hadn't happened yet. So, yeah. so, th so there's that. Um, and yeah. it really depends on what kind of person you want and to what degree you want people that are flexible in their thinking to be able to say, okay, he's shit posting right now. And I either enjoy or don't enjoy his humor but he also does all this other stuff too. So I keep abreast of his content and he entertains me or at least tries to entertain me while I'm waiting for him to produce another episode. Right. So yeah. you have yeah. to, you have to keep, you have to keep in the people's back, back of people's minds. So you have to be posting a lot. Yeah. So. Uh, no, as a fellow content creator, I, I definitely understand what you're talking about, especially with, you know, hooking them in, keeping their attention. And then what's the, the larger thing, but yeah. real quick, Ben, I'm, or Benjamin, I'm going to, pause real quick we're coming up on an hour and uh, okay. i i have like one or more one or two more questions i for you. i have two hours before i have to leave i mean i'll, I'll need to pee in about an hour so we're okay gonna... yeah if you yeah like i'm hoping like the longest episodes i've done are like an hour and a half or so but okay. i yeah you're, you're, Whatever. you're a great dude i love talking with you so yeah let me uh okay cool we'll we'll play it by ear a little bit i want to talk about just lives of tiktok i want to talk a second i'll give you a little bit uh just about my experience on YouTube, because I can relate a lot with what you're talking about, but I fucked the game up. So I'll explain that a little bit and we can talk about that a little bit. Okay. All right, cool. So here, let me put a note so I know where to edit this shit. Uh, edit, uh, all right, you ready to jump back into it? Sure, 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 sure. All right, cool. So, so when it comes to the hook, maintaining attention, and then having that kind of larger message, right? So let me tell you, let me tell you where I screwed up on YouTube. Well, I think I okay. screwed up, right? So as you know, yeah, I, I think he, I think he probably didn't, but go on. <laughs> as you know, on YouTube, there's a large like commentary community. There's drama channels where they talk about other YouTubers and everything like that. So basically, yeah. as as somebody, I, I was working at a drug and alcohol rehab. Cost like thirty grand to go there if you didn't have insurance. It was a nice we had here in Vegas, right? So I was like, hey, why don't I do like, you know, I was I was teaching people about uh, recovery and everything and mental health. I was like, why don't I just do a YouTube channel? Wasn't getting any views, right? And yeah. I wanted to help people. I wanted to get as many views as possible so I can help more people. And if it brought in some income, that was cool. Like eventually when I got laid off, it was at the height of my YouTube career uh, and I was making a full-time wage. So it was awesome. But anyways, the, the hack I found was kind of what you did. I was able to look at the drama community. They were talking about these YouTubers, right? And I was like, if I frame it kind of like drama, but I lure them in, I lure, I do, do a little bait, right? Okay. They come in yeah. thinking that I'm just another drama channel, but then I start talking about mental health, my own personal experience and, you know, uh, evidence-based therapies <clears throat> and everything. And people loved it. My channel within the first year, I hit 100,000 sub, uh, subscribers. It was like, nice. boom, it was working, right? But then people started having this weird ethical debate and calling me a, a fake therapist and everything, even though there's not a single video oh, of me saying I'm okay. a therapist, yeah. you know? And yeah. there's there's some weird gray areas, but, uh, but yeah. yeah, but yeah. So I was doing that, but I think where I went wrong, I started responding, I started defending myself, I started 
I started playing oh. into it, right? And yeah. I think that's what made me look bad. Okay. You know? Okay. So okay. so yeah. how how do you because I'm sure there are misconceptions about you from people who uh for example, the episode you talked about, like people needed to really consume the larger part of the content to really see what you were doing, right? Yeah. Or if if somebody only knows you on Twitter, they have an idea of who Benjamin Boyce is. But yeah. me, I went through like hours of your content over the weekend. And I'm like, this yeah. seems like a decent guy, right? So I took that time. Are you, you keep on like making me out to be some sort of warty troll on Twitter. Am I no. really coming across that way? Kind of, okay. So let me, actually, <laughs> kind right of, okay. Hop, That's actually, good to right know. Actually, right before we hopped on, actually, right before we hopped on, let me pull up your thing. What was it? Oh, no. What did you say on Twitter? Wait. Here, let me let me read the quote for you and you can tell me how it comes across. Okay. <laughs> Gonna teach my toddler dem strategy to hear her cry, quote, waysist when she doesn't get what she wants. Waysist. <laughs> waysist. Well, okay, that, that's a part of the if you look at what the elite Democrats are saying right now, the only like over and over and over again, the only way that they can make sense of what happened in Virginia yesterday is it's got to be the racists. It's got to be the racists. It's got to be those damn white women, those damn white women. Mm -hmm. And CRT is made up those damn white women like, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. So it's all the white women's fault. That's what CRT is. That's what yeah. it does, you know, so. And, you know, I don't like being partisan. So, yeah, I did the Dem thing because they're just, <laughs> I'm sorry. But at the same time, it's a good joke because you hey, just I, have this I visual. Wessist, <laughs> wessist. Because if, if that's the level of analysis you're doing on why you're losing, you're going to lose more. You're going to lose more and more and more. And humor should wake people up, though it yeah. doesn't necessarily get read as that. It reads, yeah. gets read as violence, as we know. To yeah people, so. yeah so so yeah to my larger point like i like if i if, say i had no idea who you were and i just came yeah. across this tweet if like yeah. this was my first introduction i'd be like this mother right but then i go yeah. to your youtube channel i hear your conversations i see these two yeah. different you know two different people it's so, very stochastic you don't know who's going to be reading it at any, any given time and you don't know where they're going to be at their day or in their life or what mood they're going to be and how they translate it and you and they don't know where you are are you again are you three beers deep in <laughs> at a friday night or are you like five uh, five beers deep a sunday morning hung over you know like where are you in yeah. your life when you're thinking this stuff and that's all it's con decontextualized the whole thing scrubbed so you just yeah. get one chunk and so you play the longer game with regards to what you're saying about uh, apologies yeah that that's the thing how do you say how do you say how do you correct people you're reading me wrong how do you have that sincere conversation when somebody is misreading you mm. the that's a big question that i had to figure out and i think i've figured it out um that I only I and it's my pen tweet. My it's my pen tweet, which oh, is a it? joke. It's it's mm. a joke, but it's being as sincere and silly at the same time. And that's the thing. Like you have to read it as me being sincere and silly at the same time because that's what I'm doing. I, I don't do anything if it's not a portmanteau or an entendre, right? That that's just mm. how that's my literary thing, and I, I can't escape that writing, uh, not prompt but uh, restraint. So. With regards to people being offended by me, I say something and they're offended by me. To mm -hmm. what degree does their offense owe to them? And what to what degree does their offense owe to me? Mm. Um, to what degree are my words violence and promoting violence and participating in a system of oppression such as patriarchy, racism, etc.? Mm -hmm. And to what degree are they reading that that way? And to what degree are they then using that, right? So I do a tweet that offends a certain group. And then they're like, oh, look at what he did. Look at what this did. And I went through with the radical feminist community and not all of them, but a certain very radically charged feminist community. I did a series of very offensive tweets and they started off by me using the wrong word. I used the word rationality to describe men and emotionality to describe women. Mm. And I was talking about intelligence and I was talking about the way in which they benefit each other. It's just two different ways of making sense. But that was read within the feminist doctrine as women are irrational, which is bad, but men aren't being Im ear ear emotional. They don't care <laughs> about that. But you know, it's playing into that thing. And then I noticed that I would get huge pushback for using these little trigger words 
and mm-hmm. and the trigger words be, were being taken out of the context that I didn't even know that they're trigger words. And I'm like, okay, so they're triggered by this. Do I need to unflip the trigger? Do I need to apologize? That first time I tried to explain myself and they didn't care. The first time I offended that group, I tried to explain myself and they just, because the swarm came down. Yeah. And they were all in attack mode. So I would make an apology to a single person that I cared about and that I respected. And then they would use that and blow it out. Like, like, so Mm -hmm. you can't apologize to a crowd. A crowd is not rational. uh, Well, no, (laughs) there's a word play there. They're not going to do it. (laughs) Well, uh, a crowd is not hurt. Uh, I I, I don't offend a crowd. I offend an individual and either Mm. you read me or not. And we have a relationship so I can be in a, in a, in a a personal relationship and I can be vulnerable to you and I can be rational with you. I can't be irrational to an angry crowd and anything that I would say will already be read through their anger and their rage and will be more ammunition to Mm. sling at me. And when all they're doing is acting out this thing that they just act out over and over and over again. And I, and then I realized that I'll offend them and about three days, it'll be done. Like yeah. they only have an attention span and they're all collected to be offended. So it's just like this swarm that's buzzing around these different things to be offended by. And it just so happened that my tweet came out on a very boring part of their news cycle, right? Yeah. So there's that level. So if I apologize, I only apologize to people I care about and I only apologize on my terms. I don't argue in comment fields. I'll maybe do one back and forth, but I don't go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Mm. I don't do that. Like, cause uh, one, it takes a lot of effort to come up with a creative way to say something that's obvious, right? And that, which is my, you know, my problem um, is that I have to be original or have to be complex. So I can't just go on that back and forth and back and forth thing. Two, mm. it's a waste of time. Three, I'm not changing anybody's mind because they're already in battle mode. So yeah. Twitter's battle mode and I just throw the things out and I get reactions, but this is the real stuff, right? Yeah. Or this is closer to the real stuff. And this is the stuff that I think will save the internet and save America, which is this, this stuff. And the Twitter stuff is important, but it's just a word game. Yeah. Yeah. I've been, I've been really surprised at, uh, because, you know, I was, uh, you know, I, I've written, I've self published a few books and stuff, but when I blew up on YouTube, my content was mm. sticking to like 10 minutes. Right. Because I'm like, yeah. people's attention fans are short, but yep. when I finally yep. just like, you know what, I read so many books, I'm going to interview authors and stuff. Like I realize mm-hmm. that people are looking for the kind of long form nuanced conversations, which you don't get yeah. on Twitter, which you don't. So what I I've been trying to do to adjust my strategy, if I feel like someone is hurt offended whatever i'm like bring it over to email talk to me over yeah, there exactly because i also have to worry about like how you're trying to you know appear to your group and everything like that it's and all the, performance yeah yeah exactly so so <laughs> finally finally i think you know this kind of ties into what made me want to bring you on was your video about libs of tiktok right uh-huh. so help me understand because i think this touches on a few things we've been talking about right like poking fun or talking about you know the the crazy progressives and things like that right yeah so libs of tiktok for those who don't know go look it up on twitter they they find the worst of the worst of tiktok people Mm. you know uh i made a comment the other day i think i think the left does this to democrats too like those videos where they go find a trump supporter who says the most ridiculous insane things and i'm like Mm. you are finding the worst of the worst i don't know how much of this is like the larger whole right but anyways can you break down what why do you think libs of TikTok is not helpful but jokes or whatever that you might be doing or that okay. james might be yeah. doing yeah. is yeah. for a larger purpose you know what i mean okay so there's different levels of analysis for that and um of course i'm gonna sound like a hypocrite because i do one <laughs> thing and, I, and i'm criticizing something that i do i'm criticizing something that i participate in and mm. i'm criticizing that which gave me a platform to begin with which was the retarded antics of social justice drunk warriors right and uh they um what you see with TikTok which is what I try to battle against. Once I started getting into the game of Evergreen, it was to expand the story. It was to expand on those 30 second clips of a professor going Mm. completely apeshit on her colleagues, uh, to expand that, to contextualize. 
and always playing a game of a broader thing. So what Libs of TikTok is doing is perfect Twitter. It's perfect marketing. It's brilliant stuff. Find the worst of the worst, the most cloying, annoying, viscerally reactive stuff that you just like, you're, you're just, your whole body just, you're watching this person like doing crazy things. And I specified in the video, there's different things that are going on. One is like professionals or adults, like fully fledged adults that are yeah. just being crazy and indoctrinating and being proud of their indoctrination and being proud of being in a position of power, enforcing this stuff on children. And then you have the 17, 18, 19 year olds that are immersed in this ideology that is irrational, is anti-rational, specifically with gender, uh, which is just, it's crazy stuff. And they're still trying to find their identity. And there's probably a lot of loneliness going on in there. There's probably mm -hmm. some mental health issues, not necessarily disorders, but just issues of people groping for not just status, but using status to solve their problems, right? So there's the, the TikTok game is still about status, but mm -hmm. especially with the underdeveloped children or young people or young adults, they, they're using status to try to solve another problem that's at a yeah. deeper level. And so what we're seeing when we see these videos is that there's a disturbed person caught up in a disturbing ideology and then incentivizing by a completely insane social media structure. Yeah. And none of that is being talked about. What's being talked about is look at how crazy the libs are. Look at how crazy the libs are. Look at how crazy the libs are. And that's fine insofar as we're talking about the ideology that's destable and we're, we're critiquing the, the higher order system that incentivizes that behavior being social media. But the fact that there's a human being there, if we, if we lose connection with the human being, and that's mm. why I try not, I, I do, I don't, I try not to make personal attacks. I, and I try not to argue with the person. And when I'm in an argument on Twitter, what I see a lot of people doing is attacking me personally and accusing me and, and uh, impugning all mm -hmm. these motivations on me based on a clever sentence that I wrote, whether or not it was really clever, I tried, <laughs> right? But they're, they're doing all this you stuff and you are doing this and you are doing this and you are doing this. And I'm like, well, you don't know any of that, so I'm not going to argue with you on that. I will bring it back to questions, clarifications, and not attack. I'm not going to attack you because I'm, I'm attacking an idea or I'm attacking yeah. a reaction to an idea or I'm attacking somebody with a lot of power like Dan Rather, who says yeah. he's a journalist and a storyteller. I'm saying, well, which are you more of in this instance? Are you the journalist or the storyteller? And how much of our, of our journalism is storytelling? and not journalism yeah. anymore with regards to that stuff. So with, I forgot the question. I, you know, the, the thing is, is that, oh, with libs of TikTok, there's no analysis there. It gets shared over and over and over again by everybody I'm connected to. And so we're, again, like I said in the video, we are conditioning ourselves to have a very narrow response to negative stimulus. And what yeah. is, and that's a problem on a group level because as Jonathan, height says uh, morality binds and blinds so what we're going to do is say these are the bad guys look at how bad they are right and and we, like we were talking about with critical race theory we can cherry pick or nut pick whatever it is all these different instances of egregious teaching and stuff but does that really solve the issue at play which is what do we do about race in america how do we have all these conversations about what education should be and should do and how do we strain ideology or to what extent do we want ideology and what kind of ideology do we want in our schools? All those questions are, uh, are, are put out of the way on us all agreeing that they're the bad guys, all yeah. agreeing that this is toxic. And then yeah. ourselves <laughs> being so righteous and, you know, in our moral indignation of this stuff that we yeah. then start to not be able to criticize ourselves. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I'm open to criticism. I, I you know, but it has to be in the format where I know that the other person is not going to use me for their own gains yeah. other than them becoming better than me at, 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 at Twitter. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. And I, I think you touched on something important there where we, you know, especially like, I think what, you know, uh, what we're talking about with lives at TikTok, maybe it's, it's, a t it's, it's a couple things. It's attacking the person rather than the idea and where it came mm -hmm. from, right? And that's, mm -hmm. that's just a big no-no, right? Like you're talking about people come for you personally and 
give you all these characteristics or talk about your morality or your, and, and nobody knows that. Nobody can yeah. tell you what you believe and stuff. But then also there's the punching down aspect, right? When you take a 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 year old kid and say, here is their TikTok, here's the dumb shit they're saying. Yeah. People are naturally going to attack that person, talk about how dumb they are, how uninformed yeah. they are or whatever. And there's nowhere else to really go. So do you see it's, that kind of being the issue? Somebody said that we need to bring back bullying or something like <laughs> bull bullying has always been there in high school. Like a 17 year old isn't, shouldn't just like not be regulated by their social environment. I'm like, okay, well, one, are you 17? Are you in high school? How does thousands upon thousands of adults attacking a teenager at all commiserate with the bullying that happens in high school? Right. And yeah. not that bullying is totally, you know, whatever that regulatory process of bullying manifests beneficially, there's got to be some sort of benefit to that with regards to and, and a lot of detriment, too. But that's how kids kind of regulate each other, especially yeah. the crazy ones. Um, but that doesn't work on the Internet. The Internet is a completely different thing. So, yeah. Uh, if you're the bully, you know, the punching up, punching down thing is really weird because that itself is weaponized. What, like what we saw with Chappelle. It's like, oh, no, there, there's a genocide. Don't ever make fun of these people, you know, like, OK, yeah. you get whatever you want and we will never question you ever again. Is that the answer? No. Yeah. Um, and with regards to this, is the problem, like there is a point to ridicule. There's a point to pointing out somebody who's errant and wrong. And on the other side of the gender thing, I, I hosted a man who opened up really wide about some really bad places that he was in and that, uh, you know, like just some bad stuff that, that he like a really depressed state, like on the edge, like really on the edge. And he totally yeah. opened up. And because it was about male sexuality, the Radfems took that and then like completely tore him apart. Like this Jesus. very vulnerable man was then used as an icon for this war against trans ideology, right? And it's like n all the young men could have benefited from seeing the end result of compulsive sexual behavior. It's like if I had somebody who was just, just barely got out of killing themselves on heroin, Right. Yeah. And and we had a really deep conversation about that. And somebody who's like from mad, you know, mothers against drugs, just like, look at this freaking heroin addict. And <laughs> da, 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 da. it's like, no, 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 no. Heroin's not good. I'm not apologizing for heroin. But, but this is we need to see that. And there's so many lessons to be learned from that. So, you know, I, I produce stuff that that offends them. Right. That mm -hmm. offends the, the rad femmes. And, and uh, you know, I, I use offensive language and I, I joke about things which they take as me denigrating them and uh, attacking them where they're vulnerable. I never do that to an individual. I never do that to an individual. Yeah. I only do that to the ideology or people who are completely possessed by the ideology, who are just talking point, talking point, talking point, talking point, talking point, right? Yeah. Who are basically synonymous with the ideology, but they're not being vulnerable. They're just acting out. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, I, I, I tweeted about it earlier. I had an episode a while back with the moral philosopher, Kurt Gray, him and you mentioned Jonathan Haidt, him and those two disagree on some just moral philosophy. I, oh, great. Anyways, anyways, I had him on to talk about the moral philosophy of cancel. Is culture. he the good one or the bad one in this debate? Uh, it depends on who you're Haidt. talking to. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan Haidt, uh, his book, The Righteous Mind, it, it opened up my eyes to mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. political conversations and having more empathy and understanding where people are from, how they were raised, what they value. So, but I understand Kurt Gray's, you might enjoy that episode. There's a lot of nuances and stuff. I'm like, I see what you're saying, but, you know, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but when I had Kurt on, because I was trying to understand when I got canceled, right? Because the, the argument against me was, you're not a licensed professional. You're talking about mental health and addiction, right? Uh, through, you know, and I, I was like, I'm sharing my personal experience. I'm sharing what psychologists say. I'm sharing what the research says, right? And they, they took it to a level of you are killing people, right? And I'm like, whoa, let's dial that back. But yeah. in, the, in the world of cancel culture, like you're talking about this, this young man who opened up about his most vulnerable stuff. No, he was a middle-aged man. Yeah, yeah when, when they when they feel that they have the moral high ground, anything goes, just all bets are off. They, you know, people were threatening to rape and kill my mom. Like she was actually getting messages, right? And I'm just like, how can you morally justify this, right? Like you feel so- In the name righteous. of morality, that's the great thing. Yeah, that's, that's what just- <laughs> That's the great thing. <laughs> that's when I really started getting into all these books and trying to understand. I'm like, how do uh, people do this? And that's, 
That's what yeah. I dislike about the uh, culture wars and everything, because once yeah. you feel that you have the moral high ground, anything goes. Like you saw with the Dave Chappelle protest, right? They they physically attacked that guy and broke his stick and, you know, and everything. And it's just like, how are you justifying this? Like you're- Repent, you're motherfucker. Repent, yeah. motherfucker. Re yeah. They were shouting that at him. It was like, what is this? Yeah. Like and the inverted, what uh, the, 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 that one Baptist, tr Westboro. Like it's yeah. like <laughs> trans Westboro. It's like the weirdest thing. Yeah. And I've just been fascinated with human behavior. I'm like, how do we do yeah. this? How do we how do we reach that point of dissonance where we can yeah. justify these things? Like, I'm trying to save lives, therefore I can threaten yours. Like that, yeah. that blows my mind. But, uh, you know, the, like. Go ahead. The thing is, is that we, I think, we're, again, this is the problem with libs of TikTok. This is the problem with, uh, with internet culture is that we're acculturated to give those people a bigger footprint in our understanding of the world because we overestimate threats evolutionary. That's the wise thing to do. But what happened at Evergreen, all those crazy things that were happening was 2%, 3% at most of the student body was involved in that, but that becomes the definition of Evergreen. But once you get into the story, it's like, okay, the institutional administrative structure was behind this. And, you know, 20 teachers were behind this and everybody else was silent and supporting this, you know. But the 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 oversized output of the activists that claim, one, they, they heighten everything up into life and death so that nobody can think or question because it's life and death. And then, two, they self-elect themselves as the you know, representatives of these entire groups of people. So they're dehumanizing everybody <laughs> that yeah. they're representing and saying, this is, we represent them. And then they're t taking their behavior. And uh, again, public eye sees mm -hmm. that those people represent all those other people. So it's hugely yeah. unjust. Yeah. With regards yeah. to that. Something I was, uh, you know, in my conversation with John McWhorter and some other people just talking about the woke stuff is here's, here's where I would get offended is, is the mm. infantilization that comes along with all of this, right? Like, don't say these things. It can drive somebody to suicide. Like, we're 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 completely just neglecting like any kind of human resilience, right? Like, we're like everybody yeah. is so sensitive that if anything is said, if anything, you know, any words, that's how words become harm, right? Like, you yeah. can't take this, and you're such a fragile, just whittle baby that you will just off yourself and like. Yeah as a father, like I would never want to teach my son that I don't want to teach him that we have to bubble wrap this entire world to make yeah. sure that you are never hurt, never have to question or, you know, uh, and I think it also stops having conversations with people like saying, Hey, like, if you are offended by something, why can't we just have like a conversation about it. But I think, you know, one of the bigger mm -hmm. things is too, as somebody who was an insane drug addict until I was 27 years old, my mental filter is fucked up. Right. I can have somebody say something and it comes in as you are just talking down to me. You are calling me names. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think uh -huh. that's been completely eliminated from the equation is that is it possible that you interpreted this thing wrong? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, do you ever see that when like you see somebody freaking out or anything like that? Like maybe they interpreted something as something that it wasn't. Well, it's about emotional regulation and, you know, going through the process of being a public intellectual is really <laughs> interesting because you're kind of a brand. And then what you're talking about, I've gone through that too, where I'm like, well, I need to apologize to this crowd. And so they're not treating you as a person, they're treating you as a persona. And then you try to bring your person like, no, I'm a personal, I'm a person. And then, and you're like, you're trying to upload this stuff into this cloud of these people that don't really care about you. They're just using you. And then, and then what do you have left over, you know, and then, and they're completely beholden to what everybody else thinks about you. So there's this process of building barriers around what I do and using as much of my personal, my personal wisdom, my personal growth and, and my personal caring and my soul, my spirit and all that stuff, putting as much of that into the internet, but still reserving this divide between the public mm. and the private and the public and the private and the way that internet kind of like latches onto you. It's always in our face. It's always in our yeah. mind. It's really difficult to do that. And when people are really going there, especially through social media and really just flipping out or really like making a mountain of, out of a molehill to whatever degree, they're not really doing anything other than expressing and they're not regulating their expressions. And my yeah. 
my uh, my time in preschool, which is around 15 years on and off of like dealing with two, three, four, five year olds, was like, okay, there's what there's, uh, let's say you're wounded, you scraped your knee. And then there's your reaction to you being scraped. And then there's the reaction to you being hurt. And the, you know, like there's the nerves of pain going up to your brain, but then there's this emotion that's much bigger than that scrape. Yeah. It's much bigger than that scrape. So the job for the teacher, insofar as I can teach somebody at that level, um, is to model like, no, you control your emotion so we can deal with the problem. Yeah. And your emotions are inflating the problem. So again, it's like if something happens 2,000 miles away that somebody gets killed because of something that's racial or whatever, and then we bring that into ourselves and then we project ourselves, we, we, we heighten the threat that's way over there that we receive through all these uh, mediums, virtual mediums, and then we bring that to us and then we're always in a state of, of harm and threat or we have a bunch of trauma in our lives and then yeah. we use these causes outside of us to work that out, but it doesn't actually end up working any of that out. It just constantly perpetuates yeah. that. It comes back to trying to recognize the human through the medium of all their expressions on Twitter and giving them leeway, you know, if they're, if they're really offended, it's probably not because of me. It's probably because of a scrape that they got in real life yeah. and trying to say, okay, uh, you know, knowing when to hold them and knowing when to fold them, you know, and, and yeah, or whatever, you know, like knowing when to joke and knowing when not to joke. And the thing is, even if you know when to do that, people are coming from all these other places in time and state. So they're going to take it out of context constantly. So it's really difficult unless you invest yourself as a human being over time where I go through all these different moods and you go through all these different moods and I'll recognize you when it's time or when I can be rational, I'll try to be rational. And when I'm joking, I'll try to do it in a way that uh, isn't personally offensive to you, you know, or doesn't yeah. denigrate your humanity, you yeah. know? Well, I've never been personally offended by your tweets, so. Well, so yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but here, so let me, let me wrap this up with, that, with one last banger of a question, because oh. here's what I'm curious about. Okay. What, what is Benjamin Boyce's overall goal? Like with the content that you create, with the guests that you bring on, with the conversations that you're having, like what is your, what is your thing that you're trying to accomplish or it like is it for you are you trying to open up your own mind through these conversations are you trying to expose other people to conversations like what 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 is your goal with this stuff that you're doing well one it's to be immortal right? <laughs> upload that enough goal? of is myself all right well, we we don't, it, it it won't happen until after my life. I'll I'll die and then I'll either be immortal or not. But I'm trying to upload as much of myself into the cloud that the AI can represent me and actually variate my way of thinking mm. through language and actually start to learn how to be witty and playful and you know and then also personable too. So there's one way I'm trying to affect the AI um, and become a mortal part of that group brain, um, which is immaterial, but. I think that there's a reality inside of our life. I think there's a life inside of life. I think that there's a, uh, no, no, I, I know and I, I feel that there's this reality that is filled with consequence and cause and effect, but there's also this, this thing that we don't really have language for or all the language that we have for is encrusted with misinterpretation because we're trying to talk about something that is a higher order than our rational mind and our discursive mind. Mm -hmm. But it's like this human spirit, this, this human spirit that connects us to the world. And the world is always giving us gifts and lessons and pouring through us constantly. And we get stuck and things come up and we lose sight of that. And all of this culture war stuff is just a, like a canvas in order to explore the human spirit and try to like, try to uncover a little bit more of that in myself. Mm. Um, and if I can, you know, I don't know if I can do anything for anybody else. I really, on that level, yeah. the human spirit would hopefully if, if I can be a channel for that, I want to be the broadest channel possible, but it's up to that spirit to do that work, but I want to be prepared to do that. And I want to provide a place for that. And so I also really care about women and children and men and my brothers and sisters in the world. I just want to care for them and care, you know, not just by 
expressing care, but giving them tools and modeling behavior that I think will help them care for themselves and each other, you know, and just kind of be good and also be clever and smart and a dick when I need to be, you know? Yeah. And just be a human, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, I think that, yeah, that that's definitely one of the things that we have to include in there. But yeah, I'll, I'll say this. Like one thing that I love about your content is just the, the curiosity, because I truly think that if we were more curious. Well, she's my patron saint, curiosity. She, yeah. is, she is. She's my patron saint. <laughs> it's, it's working out. I, I love it. But where, where can uh, my people find oh. you where uh where can they find your uh your your literary prose on twitter that you're doing yeah. and uh and yeah. your youtube channel and all that well if you want to save yourself from my incredibly partisan and low grade thinking shit posting then don't go to benjamin a boyce on twitter um <laughs> also if you want to see me uh go beyond the sentence level way of making sense you can find my literary endeavors but be warned it takes work <laughs> at alias to dream dot substack dot com. And I'm sure the link will be down there in the description and my interviews. Unfortunately, I'm gonna have to change the name or the name of this because I think that it's trademarked. So I'm kind of screwed right now until I talk to a copyright lawyer or something like that. But it's called Calm Versations or The Voice of Reason. And that's on Spotify and uh, Anchor. And also my videos can be seen on Spotify now lucky me Ooh. and yeah I, I was allowed into that uh early program um but also my youtube channel is benjamin a voice and uh come along and bring your thoughts and uh play with me in the comments Beautiful. thank you so much chris it was great to to speak with you i want to have you on my channel and then off off this recording i want to figure out how you get all these people who ignore me to not ignore you uh, there we go. We can, we can, it'll be a mutually beneficial relationship. <laughs> but yeah, man, thanks for, thanks for coming on. We'll do this again. Cheers.